Good day, everyone, and thanks for listening to another episode of the Rational Standard Podcast. Uh, once again, we've had quite a break between episodes, but on today's uh, topic, we're going, to, we're going to be discussing the topic of wildlife in South Africa. This is personally something very close to my heart, and I'm sure it's close to the hearts of many listeners. It's a really important part of the country. Uh, so I have today on the podcast, Early Rudman. Early, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. How's it on your side? Thank you very much for having me on your show, Nick. Uh, everything is fine here. I'm here in the Eastern Cape, uh, between Utnag and uh, Kirkwood in the valley bushveld region of the eastern cape so everything's fine thank you just just warming up going into summer now yeah i'm certainly feeling it here in grahamstown i can tell you that much um but uh, yeah let, let's start off early would you mind just explain to the uh, to the listeners uh, what it is you do in your position in uh, game ranching in south africa yes nick uh, um uh, first of all we uh, i live on a family farm we, we're, a, we're a family business uh, we farm with uh, wildlife or ranch wildlife, extensive wildlife ranch. Uh, my father started uh, sort of in the late 1970s hosting international hunting clients and uh, uh, things have grown ever since then. When I came back from university in the mid 90s, uh, I joined my father and my, my mom in the business and my brother also came and my sister and her husband are also here with us. So we've grown our, our, our business uh, from a, a much smaller entity where my dad started. And uh, we, we currently got a, a sizable property that we, uh, that we have hunting on and uh, entertain international hunting guests. Uh, but we also do farm with uh, livestock and gora goats, moe and that. So it's, it's uh, more than you know, one enterprise that we're running here, but the wildlife has certainly increased over the last twenty odd years, and uh, I've witnessed, you know, personally how things have improved and changed, and uh, I can I can only say the wildlife is far better off now than what it used to be, and then um, in, on a national level, I'm on a few different committees, I'm on our professional hunters association for South Africa, the Exco as well, uh, kind of represent the Eastern Cape on the, the, the national executive. Um, I'm on the wildlife ranching of the Eastern Cape as well and and our Farm Association, Exco, I'm actually going to be the chairman uh, now uh, coming up uh, as well for the next two years. So yeah, I'm quite involved in the whole industry and certainly the, the wildlife industry or aspect of it, you know. The first question I want to ask now is, you mentioned in your first answer that you said that the situation has gotten better over the years, which is wonderful to hear. Now, I'm just quite interested to ask, uh, what is it like to be a, a game farmer these days in South Africa? And I'm asking that question exclusive of the land expropriation talks which are going on. That's obviously thrown a spanner into the works. So besides that, how are things in terms of um, regulations from the legal standpoint, labor, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And, and in addition to that, I'd also like to know uh, where does South Africa compare with our neighbours Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, uh, because these are also countries which have got uh, similar flora and fauna to us. Um, and so, can, yeah, could you give me some insight onto that? Yes. Uh, no, that's obviously a, a hot topic at the moment. All our uh, meetings that we go to, everything uh, that we're busy with at the moment. Uh, this uh, particular topic or issue is uh, quite central to um, you know everyone's uh, you know kind of narrative. So it, it yeah, and it's not that easy just to kind of you know answer to, but uh, um, it, it is a, a very big concern of ours. Um, as far as comparing us to Zimbabwe at the moment, uh, it, I, I don't believe that um, we, we can obviously be anywhere near Zimbabwe right now, but that, that is the worst case scenario. Um, but at least in South Africa, we know that we have a very good constitution. Um, we, 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 our property rights are still very strong over here. So we definitely a long way off from Zimbabwe, but um, it is a big concern for us. And, you know, we, we have our various associations and organizations that represent us. And uh, if anything has happened, uh, these associations and organizations have strengthened tremendously in the last uh, 12 months or so, or certainly since the beginning of the year, since all this uh, EWC talk has taken place. So um, I'm quite happy to see that uh, how we've all come together and, and uh, uh, 
you know, tackle this whole uh, whole thing. It, it's good to to see that it's kind of bringing out the best in a lot of people in in our uh, respective industries. You know, so now I think um, I, I think we we're in a good place uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, count all this. Uh, I, I just I, all this we've got um, the elections coming up next year in 2019. So. We were expecting this anyway, um, and it's probably going to intensify. But but it's it's obviously a lot of electioneering going on at the moment, and uh, we you know as I said we're in the tourist uh, industry, and we uh, have to constantly uh, let our customers who are international tourists know that things are right here, and it's, it has been a bit difficult, and we we're definitely going to have a, a decline in. In visitors next year, but that is uh, normal for an election year. Um, in, in any African country, there's always a lot of warnings going on um, when there's an election year in, in an African country. So there will be a, a decline next year. But you know, we we do try and allay all the fears and and, and worries as much as possible. Africa is still a very safe place, relatively it's still very positive here, Nick. Oh, well, that's very very good to hear. Um, you know, obviously EWC is the one issue, uh, but I'm just interested to hear, and I, I don't know if you, this is a big topic that ever gets spoken about. Uh, you know, we have countries like Namibia and Botswana. Obviously, these countries are different in that they're a lot drier on average than South Africa. Uh, but, you know, the sort of the northern parts of Namibia, Botswana, there's similar vegetation, similar animals, and, and the same kind of business goes on there. Uh, how does South Africa compare to those countries? Yes. The you know the wildlife ranches I'm, I'm more talking about here, in terms of uh, you know regulatory mm-hmm. environments and, and and things like that. I'm sure we benefit greatly simply from having, for example, such a big international airport in in Johannesburg. Uh, so some basic infrastructure like that must benefit us. Um, uh, but from a political level, do you think there's a there's a massive difference, or is it, is it quite similar? What's going on? Yeah, no, again, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because. Obviously, our political situation is, is far, far more polarized or uh, far more uh, volatile um, than Botswana or Namibia. But then again, our population is, you know, uh, what, almost 30 times bigger than than, than those uh, those two countries. You know, we have a far bigger population. Uh, so things are going to be a little hotter over here in South Africa, uh, politically speaking. But uh, obviously, our economies are, are, are far bigger than, than those two countries. Uh, as far as our wildlife economy or our biodiversity economy goes, South Africa is, as, uh, is uh, our economy is bigger than the rest of the African continent's wildlife economies put together. We're far bigger than Namibia, far bigger than Botswana. Um, you know, we, because we have a wildlife ranching industry, we have our hunting side of it as well. Uh, so, so our tourism is obviously far uh, bigger than those countries, although they probably are a lot more stable at the moment, uh, which which counts in their favour. But um, our wildlife industry is is definitely much bigger than than uh, any of those countries. As I said, in fact, it's bigger than than the rest of the continent put together we we have a fantastic um, wildlife industry over here the fact that uh, we have ownership of property ownership of the wildlife uh, is it counts tremendously in our favor and uh, we have far more ownership in south africa than those other two countries um, where where there is a lot more state ownership of wildlife you know, uh, in those countries, we, we have we have private ownership, and that has, you know, been the the kind of catalyst for this tremendous um, industry of ours that we have at the moment. I see. Uh, well, you know, with that fact uh, existing, it it obviously goes to show that when it comes to conservation, South Africa is an incredibly important country. In conserving certain species, I believe we have the overwhelming majority, for example, of rhinos in the entire world. Um, if you were to just take the population of any species, South Africa contains the vast majority. Um, yes. So, you know, getting on to yes. the uh, topic of, of conservation, 
Uh, the one thing I was very keen to talk to you about is hunting and its relationship to conservation. And the reason I'd like to do that is that this podcast gets listened to people from all over the world, all over, all over South Africa. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of South Africans, a lot of people in mm. general, are extremely misinformed about what hunting is, uh, what the use is, where the money goes from it. And they just think you are these evil people who like to kill animals. Um, so... Uh, we, we we can let's. I'd be very interested to break that down, you know, just for the purposes of education here. So, let me first ask, which is probably quite a basic question for you, but could you explain to the viewers uh, what exactly is the link between hunting and conservation? Yes, Nick, uh, that, that that again also excellent question, uh, and uh, so many people simply don't understand that it's it's actually uh, quite a simple. To understand, I just refuse to to see the the logic and the truth in that. Um, hunting gives uh, animals or wildlife obviously value. You know, uh, the hunters pay money to come and hunt animals, especially on private land or or even to bring the, 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 the cash to pay for the animals that they hunt. And that money in turn obviously gets used uh, to pay wages, gets used for improvements, gets used for anti-poaching. Um, it, uh, it gets used for all sorts of things that goes back into the community. So hunters uh, pay for conservation. It's as simple as that. And uh, if there isn't really a value on the wildlife, on the animals, they're going to have to be uh, marginalised or there's going to have to be way made for uh, more cattle or domestic animals, uh, goats, sheep, or whatever the people are on that land are going to require to exist. So if we can for people to understand this logic that if the animals have value, the people on, on the ground, the people that are living there amongst them are going to benefit from them. And uh, photographic tour, fortunately, uh, aren't, uh, there aren't enough photographic tourists and aren't enough places that are uh, accommodate for photographic tourists to put all the animals that uh, are, are being uh, 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 housed or, or um, kept. In, in a hunting falls in where photographic tourists can't get to. So uh, it's very important to to understand that hunting does also give animals uh, wildlife value. And the, the uh, um, ecological footprint of hunting tourists is far less than the photographic tourists. So uh, hunting tourists are, are far more environmentally friendly when it comes to uh, the the uh, uh, ecological foot that um, the tourists are going to be leaving area. So hunting is favourable in that regard too. And obviously, your hunting tourists are paying a lot more money than photographic. Um, so hunting does definitely play a very very uh, important role in conservation especially uh, on uh, marginal land where not much else can uh, be, be done in any case. So, uh, as I said, the only other option then is to come and overgraze the place with cattle or goats or sheep and uh, far more into the environment than having a few hunters uh, meet or trophy hunters come and pay their money and uh, sustain the rest and sustain the people that, that live in the uh, areas where hunting does take place. So hunting is, is integral to conservation in a lot of these places uh, in South Africa and a lot of the other African countries too, where they do try and uh, protect their wildlife for, for hunters. So on this issue, you know, it seems to me like as with anything in life, it just comes down to economics and supply and demand. And the fact of the matter is, is that if it's not going to be worth someone's while to actually own uh, wild animals like we do, then there's no point in, in owning them. It's the same reason why cows are not endangered, because we make masses of money out of beef and dairy products. Um, and people need to sort of see it in terms of the, the economics of the situation. Uh, but, you know, the other element of this is that I, I think there's a, 
a great deal of miscommunication about the ethics of hunting. And I think there's a, a great perception among internet trolls that uh, these are just horribly evil people who go with machine guns and shoot down as many animals as they can see in sight or something along those lines. And obviously that's not yeah. true. And that's why the second question I wanted to ask you is, uh, could you talk a little bit about the ethics of, of, of hunting? Um, as an example, you know, what would you do? What would you not do? On what basis do you choose what animal to hunt? And, and what are the sort of uh, ethical lines that are drawn uh, for hunters who are professionals like yourself? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the first part. As you said, uh, uh, cows will never go extinct because we literally farm them. There's a value to cows, so that they will never go extinct. Anything that we farm, nothing has ever been farmed into extinction. I mean, and that's a fact. Nobody can refute that. Uh, you just take uh, whatever livestock. Nothing has ever been farmed into extinction. And uh, a lot of people never really think about that. So essentially what we're doing with our wildlife, whether it's on private land, uh, where we have far more, much more control because uh, we often have fences, um, and we have much more property rights on, on private land, but even communal or state-owned land where they do uh, uh, allow hunting, use hunting as a tool uh, for management of the wildlife, uh, they are essentially farming the wildlife. I mean, uh, it, it, it's 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 farming, it's agriculture, it's ranching of, of the wildlife. So that is the, the first thing we need to wrap our heads around is that we we are um, uh, uh, looking after our, our resource so that we can benefit as as you we are benefiting like what a farmer does. He looks after his crops, he looks after his livestock so that he can uh, sustainably utilize his resource. So, so this is essentially what we are doing. I mean, you can uh, um, look at it in many different ways as you, you, you use the word uh, ethics, and um, it's a very uh, obviously important uh, topic in our whole industry, especially at the moment. Um, uh, but uh, essentially what we are doing is that we are utilizing our resource. Now, obviously, how we do it uh, uh, does come down to things like ethics, and uh, we, we uh, people obviously uh, uh, debate and uh, and have a lot of um, animosity towards each other. How we how we do go around utilizing sustainably uh, this resource? So yes, uh, ethics is is a is an important thing, but. Uh, I've just seen over the years, and um, um, the, this is why I'm on these associations now and all that, uh, you know, like you mentioned, uh, the internet and the trolls and all that type of thing, and it really has an effect on uh, a lot of people who don't understand how uh, the internet or how the social media works with all these trolls and sock puppets and uh, fake accounts and all that type of thing, and, and how people get attacked, and, and, uh, and, and it, it literally has... Had a, a, a very bad um, influence on a lot of people in our industry because uh, of, of the things that they read about their own industry. So it has, done, it has led to a lot of introspection and a lot of uh, uh, finger pointing, if you want to say it like that, uh, you know, uh, about role players, uh, different associations, organizations in our industry. And it's, it's sad because essentially we are all utilizing, as I said, sustainably our resource. We are working towards a, a, a common goal to, uh, to, to uh, utilize and harvest our, our wildlife. And, uh, and ethic is, a, um, is, is obviously a, a, a sore point in the whole thing. You know, we, we, uh, we, I think we spend far too much time worrying about the ethics and, and not concerning ourselves about the reality or the fact is that we need to ensure sustainability of our, our resource um, because we, we we can all argue for forever about what is an ethical hunt or what is an ethical way to harvest the animal or, or not so the, if you have 10 different people in a room asking about ethics you'll probably have 10 different uh, answers to to what is ethical or not so what we have done is is uh, just 
decided that uh, to, to stop fighting with each other about this ethical uh, question is to rather say what is legal and uh, what is not legal and then take it from there. And then people can decide for themselves about ethics um, as, as to how we uh, use our resource or how we essentially farm our resource, our wildlife. So, um, uh, yes, coming back to what you said again, the, the trolls and all that, you know, it, I've seen, I've been on, on social media, I've been on internet now basically since it's, you know, started and I've seen how it's progressed. And uh, uh, it has had a, a, quite an impact on our whole industry. Um, the, the most interesting thing for me is that, is that you, uh, I don't know if you remember Cecil the Lion. Yes, of course. Uh, that happened, I think, about th three or four years ago. Now, Cecil was hunted uh, as a free-range lion, very ethically. I think they tried to shoot him with a bow or a crossbow or something. And uh, he unfortunately got wounded, you know, uh, Mr. Palmer, Dr. Palmer, the dentist, wounded him, unfortunately, because it was an extremely difficult hunt. And um, the, the, they had to go and track this line, and it went in back into the park or something. So it created a, a huge international outcry, um, outrage. You know, it, was, it was catastrophic, almost. And uh, we, we talk about pre-Cecil and post-Cecil in the hunting world nowadays because it had such a, a massive impact. And that lion was a, a wild, free-ranging, ethically hunted lion. So he, he created a, 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 this kind of an avalanche in our industry. So I find that very ironical, actually. You know, so, yeah, so coming back to your question, um, when it comes to ethics and uh, how we handle all this, uh, it's, it's kind of a... Um, yeah, how can you say? I mean, it's it's all it just boils down to the subjectivity, really. So, what what we say is, if it's legal, it's ethical, and and that's how we have to uh, adopt stance to try and move forward in this whole situation at the moment. Because uh, yeah, it is, it's it's a bit of a, a jungle out there, especially with with the social media and and the internet. It has a lot of positives. I mean, I, 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 I think we—it's improved our whole industry in many respects. But it has this uh, dark side or negative side that uh, a lot of us just need to understand. You know, most people that live out in the bush or in rural areas have never really delved into this. Um, how can you say almost underworld of, of you know social media and how people get abused and all that type of thing. You know, uh, you almost need to to uh, really develop a tough skin to survive a lot of type of abuse or doxing, or whatever they want to, whatever you want to call it. You know, so so that is often a a, a, a real worry for for a lot of us. But as long as this hunt is legal or uh, our, our, uh, um, uh, <laughs> movements or whatever, everything's legal. Nobody can really say too much from that because, as I said, ethics is a is a very subjective issue, in especially in hunting. Because you know, some people say that it's unethical to use a high powered rifle with a scope. You know, some people say it's unethical to use a compound bow. You know, some people say it's unethical to hunt um, an animal in a camp that's only 500 hectares or a thousand hectares. You know, other people say it's unethical to hunt behind any fence. You know, uh, some people say, how can you shoot any cat or how can you shoot any, uh, you know, w w whatever animal that they just happen to like very much. So it's it's a very subjective issue. Um, and uh, I think to try and uh, get over it is just to understand that if it's legal, it's ethical. And uh, that has made things a lot easier, certainly for myself and a lot of the rest of our industry. Who, who, who try to, uh, you know, keep moving forward. So can I ask, uh, you know, I, I fully understand what you're saying there, and I find it quite interesting that you guys now talk of things in terms of before Cecil and after Cecil. I mean, that really was a massive storm on social media. Uh, you know, just to, again, yes. just to sort of educate the listeners, you know, I've been to a game farm multiple times, 
you know, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm a client uh, who's been recommended to you by an outfitter and I want to shoot a kudu. Uh, I presume you would not uh, completely randomly choose a kudu. For example, things like, you know, if it was a pregnant and about to give birth, that, that would be completely off the table. So could, could you, you know, you're a professional in this industry. Could you give me an example of, of, of like sort of on what basis when somebody comes to your farm and wants to hunt, uh, on what basis do you choose which one can and which one can't? Um, you know, stuff like that always interests me because it gives people an idea that this is not just random cruelty. This is thought. Because if you yeah, do it unsustainably, yeah, but, then it, it can't work, you know? Well, again, again uh, Nick, uh, you know, I use an analogy of, of uh, farming, uh, um, you know, of ranching. I mean, how, how does a farmer choose what... Uh, steers or, or what uh, goats he's, he's going to take out, you know, the ones he's going to cull, uh, how does he choose? You know, he's got his plan. So as a professional hunter or a game farmer, you have your your uh, your plan, your, your uh, harvest plan or your management plan. You know which ones you want to remove out of the uh, herd or, or the crop or whatever uh, you are busy farming. So uh, you know is going to go and destroy your um, your asset, you know, by shooting out pregnant females or shooting young ones. That, that's going to be an absolute waste. You want to remove the older animals, the uh, the ones that have lived their life, that have reproduced, or the ones that aren't going to reproduce that are uh, cull animals. Those are the ones that that you obviously target. So again, um, as I said, it's it's you literally are. Uh, farming, we are utilizing sustainably our resource. So we have a plan. That's why every hunter that comes, uh, especially the international hunters, uh, by law, have to have, have a professional hunter with him. They are not allowed to hunt on their own. So that already um, uh, uh, solves that problem that you're going to have people running around just, you know, murdering, or, or I won't say murder, that, that's you do to humans, but uh, just killing indiscriminately. So it is very well regulated in that respect. As I said, it, it comes down to essentially to self-regulation. So there is definitely a plan. Nothing uh, gets uh, gets wasted. And and again, it's it's uh, most of these animals are owned by the rancher, by the outfitter. So um, he's not going to just destroy his his own resource, his own livelihood. You know? Yes. Now, uh, to segue to the next topic, uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, South Africa is the country which has by far the largest population of rhinos. I think quite a large majority of, in pure numbers, of the rhinos of the world. Uh, and we've had some very interesting developments with, with the trade in trophies from, well, not trophies really, but body parts of, uh, carcass parts of rhino and elephant. Uh, I know... I think it was last year or the year before Donald Trump or some somewhere in the the American one of the American cabinet positions lifted the ban on trade of uh, ivory I think from certain African countries and in addition to this China was planning to uh, lift the ban on the use of rhino horn in certain situations although I just recently read an article today from South China Morning Post that they've postponed that um, but in any case, you know, I, I'm personally, again, approaching this from an economic view, um, it seems to me that one of the reasons why owning a rhino is a problem is because the horns, due to scarcity and the, the fact that they're difficult to come by, the price of rhino horn has increased so much that people are willing to go to really dangerous lengths to get them. So, uh, I, uh, and uh, in our casual conversation, we also mentioned CITES, CITES, C-I-T-E-S, this organization um so, so so let's first of yes. all t t talk about uh, that organization what exactly do they do and i know you mentioned they have some problems so maybe you can elaborate on that yeah, yeah. cites is the convention for the international trade of endangered species um so it's it's an international organization it's actually part of the the united nations um it was set up by the united nations uh, many many years ago i think in the i don't know if it, 60s or something, 70s. It's been around for a long time. Um, uh, so yeah, so they they set out to uh, restrict or control the international trade of basically of wildlife, and they have different 
uh, tiers or levels of, uh, of of putting species on. So if site is one, it's, it's, it's a very difficult animal to or, or a species to to uh, have a, um, international borders to trade with. And if it's site is three, it's it's a lot easier. So it, in in effect, uh, they call it endangered species. A lot of those are not endangered species. So the whole name site is is actually uh, flawed. It's from, it shouldn't be. They shouldn't be called endangered species. So, um, it, it, uh, yeah. So personally, I, I, I have a lot of um, uh, uh, problems with CITES, and uh, uh, as I said, it's an international organisation. So they've got representatives from all over the world, from all different countries that uh, are part of this uh, uh, big organisation, and uh, it, they they vote. They use democracy to to um, uh, affect their uh, policies, you know, on the, on the different uh, trading of the different species. So, unfortunately, what has happened is, is uh, the, the, the whole organization, well, not the whole, but the, uh, uh, the organization has become infiltrated with a lot of uh, animal rights people, unfortunately, and, um, and uh, there's... Uh, been evidence of people uh, being um, bribed to vote certain ways by animal rights organizations, unfortunately. Uh, Godfrey Harris, he talks a lot about it. Um, and uh, the True Green Alliance, they mentioned that they talk a lot about it as well. Uh, that they, they organizations, Godfrey Harris um, is from California, True Green Alliance is an African organization. And uh, they documented a lot how uh, CITES has uh, almost become corrupt because uh, of, of uh, the animal rights um, uh, activists who, who actually bribe a lot of these dignitaries or delegates who can vote. So they sway decisions um, as far as the trade of interna uh, over international borders of these different species. They sway and you know stop the trade, the legal trade. They 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 ban the legal trade of different wildlife um, uh, products, unfortunately. And um, and and it's sad because people in other countries are effectively telling uh, people in other in in, in in a faraway place how to then manage or stop them from managing their own resource. So. Um, um, it, it's 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 a problem for conservation, certainly in Africa. You know, uh, a lot of these species now don't have the value that they that they actually should have to the local people. Uh, Godfrey Harris, he uh, even goes as far as saying that um, CITES is, is is a racist um, organisation because they are literally telling Africans how to manage their their resource. So yes, uh, unfortunately, yes, it has its um, has its uh, problems. Uh, it has done a lot of good in certain areas. There are people that have tried uh, uh, very hard to to use it for the good, but unfortunately, it's been infiltrated by the wrong people, and uh, they are just opposed to all utilization of of um, animals, uh, wildlife, and certainly the trade. Of, of wildlife and animals, and uh, and this is actually having a, a, a backfiring effect. If you look at what it did to to rhinos in Africa, um, you know, to to elephant poaching and this type of thing. So it uh, it's not the, the, the there are a lot of unintended consequences that have arisen from societies, unfortunately. Um, but uh, there is going to be uh, the societies. Uh, convention is going to be next year in Sri Lanka so hopefully things can happen over there uh, and uh, and and they can they can see the damage that has been actually done in many respects by societies well we'll certainly be playing uh, paying close attention to that conference then I mean it's such a pity it's like we have this massive intergovernmental uh, organization and you know I, I wanted to ask uh, you know China obviously recently lifted their, well, was planning to lift their ban, but I, I don't even see that that would have any effect whatsoever because if you can't trade these things internationally, 
it seems a little bit like um, yes. not really sure ex exactly what it'll, that'll have mm -hmm. as an effect on the the price of rhino horn. I don't know if you would be able to comment on that. Yeah, yeah. You see, you see what what happened in 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 two thousand and nine. Uh, there was a moratorium on the legal trade of rhino horn in South South Africa, uh, and uh, I mean we all know what happened uh, after that. Yeah. Um, although there, there, there was there was a Really, the poaching was really increasing before that, but I believe that stemmed from 2004 when uh, South Africa got a whole new, uh, a massive new set of environmental legislation, the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act called NEMBA, 2004, and there and I think a lot of people saw what was coming. So um, uh, they, uh, the, you know, the, they were afraid that their rhinos or rhino, the horn was not going to be uh, tradable anymore. So. It, I think they increased, started increasing the poaching, and then 2009 they, they put a ban or moratorium on the legal trade uh, in the inside the country, and then it just blew up after that. And then in 2015 the moratorium got lifted. It has uh, reduced the poaching a little bit, but there's still there's still a lot of poaching and damage has kind of been done. You know, the the, the, the horses are uh, basically bucked. So, um, so yes, uh, unfortunately. It, it has had a, a, a very bad effect on, on rhinos, certainly in the rest of Africa. But then it, remember, it's only really South Africa that still has rhinos. Uh, uh, Namibia has got some uh, rhinos, a lot of black rhinos. I think they might have the largest black the population of black rhinos. South Africa has got by far the uh, biggest white rhino population in Africa. In fact, I think our white rhinos are more than the whole of the rest of Africa's rhinos put together. So... Uh, so yes, uh, the banning um, didn't do uh, the rhinos any favour um, or favours. So yeah. it just goes to show, you know, uh, 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 the only the only hope of success is if we try and legalise international trade um, of 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 wildlife products and uh, let let Africa decide for itself how it wants to utilize and essentially again coming back to what i always keep saying we're literally farming these animals whether it's private land or communal land there has to be a value uh on on these animals and certainly on an international level or stage otherwise uh, there's only the black market and as i said this this is what uh, what's killing the wildlife is uh, the black market yeah, you know, besides uh, African rhinos, I'm aware that I think uh, the, the next most popular species is, or well, certainly of the Asiatic rhinos, is the Indian rhinoceros, which exists in some parts of Assam in India. Um, but besides that, it's like basically just critical endangerment. And, you know, I don't know if you, if the listeners here have read the story of uh, Lawrence Antony's uh, efforts to try save the northern white rhino, but that was a, a really tragic story, which... Uh, you know, just show the, the death of a species basically as a result of government bureaucracy. Um, I would encourage anyone to read the book, yeah. The Last Rhinos. Really tragic, unfortunately, but I think, I believe the last Northern White died quite recently. Um, yes. Okay, so I think, you know, it, it, it seems to me uh, quite intuitive. Uh, last question, you know, whenever I mention that I think that we should open up trade of, of rhino horn, which sounds crazy to a lot of people, this really sounds like a completely radical idea. Um, and a lot of people respond by saying, well, then the demand will increase. Um, I think, you know, then mm -hmm. supply will naturally meet demand because I don't know what the, the current situation is. If you're a, a game rancher in South Africa and you have a rhino on your farm, uh, it's sort mm -hmm. of just like a massive hazard. Um, I'm, it's a beautiful animal, but, you know, you'll have these uh, really organized criminals who, I, I mean, maybe you can, can I actually ask you a little bit about uh, rhino poachers, poachers of ivory and uh, rhino horn? So I understand that there are basically two kinds of poachers. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not a farmer, of course, but this is my knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's basically two kinds of poachers. The one is a, a poor guy who will put a snare out in the field and maybe catch a buck and he'll bring that home and, and have some food for a few days. And the other kind yeah. is yeah. all the like the big criminals who go after ivory and, and rhino horn. And um, can I ask yes, you, yeah. can, can you talk about, uh, what, what do you know about the, the sort of people that poach rhinos and elephants and is it mostly internationals or are South Africans getting recruited in there as well? Um, well, you know, uh, obviously South Africa is 
quite large. So um, I'd say close to the borders, uh, certainly around uh, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, those are, are certainly uh, you know foreign nationals coming over from uh, to poach those ones. Um, here in the East in Cape, uh, it, it has been documented that, it, that, that a lot of the poachers were international as well. Um, a lot of local people too. So, um, yeah, it, it, it is international um, to a large degree uh, because they've basically been poaching these animals in, in those, their respective countries already. So they're already part of the illicit or illegal trade. And uh, South Africa is obviously uh, now the only country or besides Namibia that has a lot of uh, rhinos. So they're going to focus their attentions here. Um, and coming again, it's because uh, those countries over there uh, to the north, uh, they, they were all uh, restricted in, in legally trading with their, their resource many years ago. But, ah, as I said, scientists. So, um, so th that created the, the, the big vacuum in those countries. And uh, now they, they're turning their attention to South Africa. So, yeah, I know it is a, it, 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 it's, it's obviously a, a, a sum of many parts, this whole illegal trade. But I certainly believe that uh, it, it can be uh, overcome if, uh, if the legal trade is, is uh, allowed internationally. Um, Said between China and South Africa, if there can be legal trade, the, the, the farmers in South Africa are some of the best farmers in the world. They've, well, they've been documented to be the best farmers in many respects. So we will make a plan. We will farm them, and we will use the money we make to defend our properties. And uh, and I, I will even go so far as to say that we will uh, have an oversupply of rhino horn if we allow to do it to our full abilities. So I have, I have no worries about... Um, uh, uh, creating or stimulating a demand. I mean, you know, as I said, we farmers, we farm with uh, livestock, with goats, and uh, we, we constantly have problems with stock theft, but because we can trade with our goats and we can sell the products, we uh, earn an uh, income and we use that to fight off the poachers. And, uh, and, and the goats, you know, are not going extinct because of the of us stimulating the the demand. So we should think of rhinos in the same way. There's no difference. Well, Early, thank you very much for talking about this topic. I think I, I fully agree with you. The bottom line is that uh, you will never beat economics on this issue. And I think if people just to learn about the sort of concepts of scarcity and the way in which the game ranch's business structure actually works. Uh, then, you know, hopefully if we just get a bit of awareness, a lot of these people have never set foot on a farm before and they think they can legislate and, and they know better and it's really frustrating. Um, so, you know, I'm glad you could uh, explain and the viewers can perhaps uh, learn something new about this and perhaps go visit a game farm one day that's privately owned and actually talk and, and see how it goes. Well, thanks very much for listening to another episode of the Rational Standard Podcast. Uh, early, uh, where can we reach you if we'd like to come hunt one day or follow you on social media? Um, uh, yes, well, first of all, thanks very much for having me, uh, Nick. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure talking about conservation and, and uh, how we do it, uh, consumptive use and uh, sustainable utilization. Is, uh, as you say, a lot of people don't understand how it works, but it's actually quite simple. It's we literally farming our, our resource, and uh, nothing's ever been farmed into extinction. But um, I am available. I've, uh, I'm on Twitter. It's just my name, Early Rudman, uh, on, uh, on Early Rudman at, at Twitter. Um, I'm on, on Facebook, even on Instagram. It's my name, E A R D L E Y Rudman, R U D M A N. Uh, um, uh, on, on all three platforms, uh, we, we uh, our outfit is called Bokra Safaris. Um, yeah, in the Eastern Cape. So. Um, I'm pretty readily uh, available. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much for talking on the show. I'm going to end off here. Thank you very much for listening to another episode of the Rational Standard Podcast. As usual, subscribe to us on iTunes, listen to us on Peeper, uh, and give us a like and a share and a, and, a, and a review on iTunes. It always helps us. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time.